in crime. Thanks, Joe. Back in the 2000s, uh, when uh, energy became very popular in the venture capital industry, a lot of people rushed into doing all kinds of stuff. And at Venrock, uh, because I, where I had been and how I thought about it and my seniority in the firm, we sat, actually stopped and thought about it for a while. And we said a couple of things. We're not going to invest in anything that requires subsidies, because subsidies often go away. We're going to invest in things that can scale, because scale will win. And you have to keep in mind that whatever technologies you invest in, you're competing in a commodity market. Electricity is commodities, oil is commodity, sunlight's a commodity. So uh, in, in normal venture capital investments, look for big spreads, right? So I can have high pricing and have big margins and all that. That was not true in energy, and I think a lot of people got their head handed to them. But I had a fun time uh, in my career. One of the things I want to point out in some of Joe's graphs, we have 100 plants in the United States. I think it's maybe 99 now. They're going to go away in 25 years. That's the largest significant contribution to CO2 is the loss of those nuclear plants in the United States, in the world. Innovations are in hand. We have, this, this country has a history uh, with 50 different reactor designs. Joe alluded to one. There are 50 of them out there. These things were tested, run, shut down. Back in the 50s, an admiral named Rick Hover made a decision to build submarines run by power plants based on uranium, and he picked water. And that pushed everything towards water. And for the longest time, back actually the 40s and the 50s, uranium water-cooled plants was what it was all about, and so the whole system sort of focused on that. It was a great decision, a, a, a powerful decision, but it left a lot of good ideas in the dust, which is where we are today. Entrepreneurs are willing and able. So universities are full of grad students. I am stunned. When I was a nuclear engineer back in the early 70s, Texas A&M, there were 50, I had graduated with 53 guys. Texas A&M today has 500 students in their nuclear engineering department. Why? It's all about climate change. I've been down there. I've talked to these students. They, you know, they, they don't necessarily stick to nuclear, but they get the, the understanding, the principles, and so forth. But a lot of them are going overseas, India and China, as a matter of fact. But the universities are full of grad students interested in this. Again, climate change is a big driver. Well, is risk capital willing and able? Well, it turns out it is. Uh, I did a little study with some guys in Washington. There's presently over a billion private dollars invested in nuclear energy in this country today, in North America, in North America today. A billion dollars. I, didn't, I, didn't, had, I had no idea it was that much money. I've got a list here in a minute. And then sponsorship. Well, the financial sponsorship is quite limited. The regulatory sponsorship, you would say, well, that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it's a, well, it's a problem. Uh, and utilities, they're hungry for power, low, cheap, clean power. There's mandates to make it clean, and of course, they're in the commodity market, so low cost wins. That's what you gotta have. So the path to success is, is, is it clear? Is it risk adjusted? Not in the United States. As Joe alluded, in China, they sort of push some democratic uh, elements out of the way to do their nuclear program. So we concluded at Venrock in the 2000s that nuclear was ripe for disruption. And just, I was slightly biased being a nuclear guy, but let me, uh, let me just assure you that I'm not just only nuclear. I have 23 kilowatts of solar on my house. I made the investment. My electric bill went to zero. Uh, this is where it started. So I, uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission was fun because I learned a lot about where our country was in nuclear, the movie addressed the issues on the table. And so some coming out of the movie, a bunch of us got together at my house in March of 2013. Joe Skyped in for that meeting. And we assembled this group called Nuclear Reimagined. And we said, okay, well, let's figure out what's going on. Clearly, we gotta get the NRC involved. Clearly, we gotta get the Hill involved. So some of these names you may know, but we came to Washington uh, twice. On the second trip, we were received with open arms. Unbelievable, just unbelievable. And in fact, two weeks from Monday, the White House is convening a private session on nuclear energy. Uh, me and many other people are involved, about 35 of us. But it was, so if you go back to 2010, it's been a five-year effort. If you go to 2013, which is kind of when we organized ourselves, it's been a two-year effort. So in two years, we've gotten the White House, including the President, to acknowledge that nuclear is there. We've gotten the DOE to put nuclear into the nation's energy plants, which weren't there beforehand, believe it or not. Nuclear wasn't even discussed in what this thing's called the QER, the Quadrennial Energy Review. 
We've got industry players who are interested. I've talked to, I don't know, half a dozen nuclear utility CEOs from uh, John Rowe to Tom Fanning to Tom, uh, Tony Early and others. They're interested as customers. So it seems like everything's coming together. The one thing that's holding us back is the NRC. And uh, the NRC is not capable of licensing things. I could spend 30 minutes on why the NRC is not capable of licensing things outside of water. But Chairman Burns, who's the president, uh, the current chairman of the NRC, is personally engaged. It's on his agenda, and we are working with him to come up with new regulatory framework. If you go to the NRC and you want to build a power plant, they will tell you that your reactor building has to be 13 feet thick and have this kind of capacity and stuff. Why? It doesn't make sense if you've got an atmospheric pressure power plant rather than a 2,500 PSI power plant. It doesn't make any sense, but yet that's the way the regs are written. So we have to undo that in order to do it right. Again, the thing that makes this question pressing is that unless you give the Chinese and Indians all, an, all, a clearly perceived alternative to coal, that means cheap enough and scalable enough, probably by mid-20s, the plants, mid-20s, the plants will have already been built. The carbon will be in the air, and it will be too late. And can I add to that? It's a 50 to 100 year decision. So that plant's built and it's going to run for 100 years. So it's, that's what makes urgency important. Uh, my hope is that a miracle will happen in Paris. My fear is that people will be people. And so you need a technical miracle. And by the way, I think we'll see other miracles. This is the only one I know you can deliver on, uh, in my opinion. Thank you all very Thank much. Very we much. appreciate you taking the time. Radio. Thanks. <clears throat>